Hello there, my name is Jordan Leroy Hansen, also known as LeDev, and welcome to Top Deck Thoughts. Continuing on the Ikoria spoilers, we got actually a couple more today. I thought they were going to reveal the whole set today, but that's not the case. They're actually going to reveal it tomorrow. So that's going to be about 90 cards tomorrow, so that's going to be fun when that happens. But nevertheless, they revealed a few more, including a cycle that we're actually going to get started right on since it got since it's on the top. Well, not the top here, but it's going to be the one that we're going to talk about pretty soon. Nevertheless, if you like this series, please like and subscribe. If you have any opinions on the cards for yourself that I talked about today, you can leave them in the comments down below. I always like to see input and constructive criticism and stuff like that. Nevertheless, let's go down and actually talk about this because, well, we finally figured out what the rare, rare land cycle is, and I'll just show the alternate art of this, but uh, you pretty much will get the cycle of this. It's the Triome cycle, and what it is is it's a land type of both of basic land types, well, not basic, but land types of, for example, this is of the Teemer variety, which is a forest, island, and mountain wedge. And then you can tap it to add any of that mana of any color. But first, it enters the battlefield tap. However, you can also cycle it for free. And as you could probably suspect, they have this all within the enemy wedge colors. They have the Teamer variation. They have the Jeskai variation, Mardu variation, as well as the Sultai variation of these lands, and Absent variation. Overall... I like these cards a lot for a few reasons. One, this is actually pretty much going to be an all-star EDH card because it is definitely one of those EDH players always like to look for lands to help them with their fixing and such. And if you're playing kind of like a free color to even a multicolored deck, you might be considerate of these. Now granted, they do enter the battlefield tap, so I don't think they're the most competitive lands, so to speak. However, I do think they are just perfectly functional. Just the factor is you get a multicolored land, get interested in tap, but you can counteract that with stuff like, like for example, uh, the amulet I always forget the name of, like the one that you always see in Primeval Titan type of decks and such, Titan Amulet Titan or something like that. I always have a brain fart on the name of that. Uh, someone will remind me in the comments down below. Anyway, so pretty much you, with the exception of that, you can definitely counteract that. But, yeah, obviously good for Commander, but I do think this is a card that's going to be interesting to talk about for standard applications. I see a lot of people, when they look at this new Rare Land cycle, that they are just going crazy with it. Like, even in decks that are just, like, two colors to even just, like, three colors, they're trying to put, like, play set of these type of cards in their deck. And I'm just going to say something right off the bat. You don't want to do that. That is not probably the most wisest approach when guarding to doing the deck design of these type of cards in my in my personal opinion if i'm being perfectly honest i think the best approach when using these lands in standard i think you mostly want to only use them in either free colored decks of the specific wedge or if you're doing four the five colored decks and even then i would kind of restrict myself to if, let's say, for example, you're in, like, let's take a look at the Keydra Triumph. Let's say you're in a free color deck of the Teamer variety. I would say, at most, three, but honestly, I would say two, because we still have stuff like Fable Passage in the format, which could be a lot more faster mana, depending on the circumstances. So, yeah, and even then, because then you're not paying too much of an opportunity cost when playing this. And also, later down the line, when you don't need the mana, you can then just spend the free mana and cycle it. I do feel like many people are going to try to play a place out of this card within their deck designs, and with the exception of a few decks, like maybe Cycle Matter deck designs and such, I think that's going to be a lot more problematic than they think. I think when people get more refined when using these lands and such, they're probably going to stick to two, maybe three, and I think that's kind of why I like this Rails Cycle Land a lot, because when we see stuff like Shock Lands or a lot of the dual lands, essentially, that we originally had in the past, mostly, most of those cards are kind of like you have to absolutely have a playset to help be competitive in the mana. While these land cycle, I really don't think you need a playset for your deck, and that's why I kind of like them a lot. I think you can get away with one honestly, which is perfect for people who are trying to budget wild cards and such. 
And most oftenly, if you're playing like a competitive deck that's a multicolored, that I think it's going to have the best use of these type of cards, you're probably only going to put two, maybe three. I don't see people playing a play set as much as... Even though we have a lot of ramp in the format, but granted, I could be wrong, but I highly doubt it. Nevertheless, I love this cycle. This is a really cool cycle that they have in Nicoria. They also have one of my favorite uh, color pairs as a tri land, which is the Mardu land. And also, I should bring out the obvious, since the factor that it is also the the land type of Mountain Plain Swamp or whatever land type of the specific wedge. This can be fetched with the fetch lands or specific cards that can fetch specific like forest plains, swamps, and such. So you got to keep that in mind. Nevertheless, it'll be definitely interesting to see how this sees impact in standard. I do think it's going to be one of those where people are going to go crazy out of that first, but I do think it's a moderately good rare land cycle that you just don't want to go crazy on. But if you optimize it to the right advantage, it will be a very Powerful land within your deck. Next up, we got both the alternate art, but let's actually see the original art, because I think the original art is a lot more funny. <laughs> the Porca Parrot. Three and a red for a bird beast. I mean, look at that. I pretty much said this on Twitter when I saw this reveal from the person who revealed it and such. And I pretty much said... If we're going to, this is, if Akoria is going to be the standard unset, this is probably the closest to revealing that if already all the other stuff hasn't showed us. Also having a reprint of Super Death Ray and such. <laughs> anyway, let's actually get to the card. It's a bird beast. It's a free four. You can mutate it for two and a red. We already talked about mutate in previous videos, but it has an ability that this creature deals X damage to any target, or X is the number of times this creature has mutated. So, for example, you mutate this, say, on one creature, then it's pretty much then going to be a one-cost tapper, essentially. Tappers are just stuff that you always have to keep in mind. We call them Tims, essentially, in the format. You always have to keep in mind on Tims, especially in the limited base format, since they can be used for semi-combat tricks and such, like predictable combat tricks. But even then, you can also use it to get, like, the final points of damage into an opponent. And the scary fact about this card is the factor that this can incrementally become a bigger peener like if you have a lot of mutates within your deck this could then become oh deal two damage to any target or three damage to any target or four or five like it'll be interesting to see how in sealed how big this can be is but it is definitely something you want to keep an eye out because i do think it's one of those semi not like a limited bomb but it's a really good limited card if you're in the mutate style deck design because there are times where this could just be like tap it deal lightning bolt damage to anything and that is legit scary like that can pretty much put a target on this card pretty quick so keep an eye on this for limited in constructed eh, it'll be fun to brew around but i don't think it's going to be competitive especially with how much removal we have in the format that can pretty much the minute you try to do shenanigans with this card it's just gone who knows maybe i'm wrong but we'll see Next up, Easy Prey. One and a black for an instant. Destroy target creature with converted mana cost two or less. It has cycling for two mana. Now I know that for some many people they are kind of looking at this and comparing it with Heartless App and being like, well this is a really not that great removal spell. And I do think that's going to be one mistake that people are going to make because this is actually a pretty dang good dot 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 sideboard card. This could sometimes see play in mainboard if you're playing this best in one in an arena, but honestly, I think this is a lot more better sideboard card than people take for granted. Because, honestly, this is a card where you gotta keep in mind, it's unconditional removal for anything that's converted mana cost 2 or less. So, a lot of people do play some powerful 1-drops, 2-drops in the format. I'm thinking, like, par like there's stuff like, well, you can't target Paradise Druid, but there's stuff like Eben, Legion, the Eben of the legion or i always get the name of that one drop vampire that's absurd there's also stuff like uh steam can elemental and pretty much really all the one and two drops you see in red matter decks and also in white matter decks like this kill easily kills in a giant sprite mate like that which heartless act would have a problem to remove to be quite frankly honest because they can't target it when it gets a counter on it so yeah 
I think this card is going to be a lot more better standard viability than people will take at first credit. Plus, the factor is, once you, I can even see an argument for even just mainboarding this in best of one in Arena. And then, because then, if you're in a matchup where the card becomes quote-unquote useless, you still have the cycling ability of this card and then draw into better stuff that hopefully will answer the board state. And then you can sideboard it out when you know that's not going to be the best removal. So, I think this is a lot better than people are giving it credit for. So, I'd say keep an eye out on this. Easy Prey is actually an easy addition to any standard deck. Plus, that art is legitimately awesome and hilarious at the same time. <laughs> anyway, so, now we go on to one of the more silly cards we have seen in a while. Unpredictable Cyclone. Five mana for an enchantment, and it does the following thing. So, this is a bit of ward soup, so I'm going to have to say this. <clears throat> If a cycling ability of another non-land card would cause you to draw a card, instead exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a card that shows a card type with the cycled card. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost, then put the exile cards that weren't cast this way on the bottom of your library in a random order, and it also has cycling too. Well, this is a potentially very powerful card in the cycle matters type deck designs, because for many people, this is a possibility storm. So, you can sometimes do some best-case mentalities of, say, let's say you cycle, say, like a cheap two-drop fair. You could, in theory, depending on how you coordinate your deck design, use that to actually get a ridiculously high-cost creature within your deck. The problem, though, is, and I think it's, well, it says so in the name, it's going to be very unpredictable, because... There are some times where maybe you're going to cycle something and then you're going to get like a ridiculously big threat. I think that's also going to be some times where you cycle bear and you legitimately are just going to get a bear. However, I do think that's also the primary strength of the card because then it helps you still build the board presence, which building board presence is always a good thing to do. And the factor is cycling has the cost, cost that when you discard and draw, you're not really building your board presence. Well, Unpredictable Cyclone kind of fixes that cost, more or less. You're still definitely going to have to try to brew your deck around this card, per se, to accommodate for it, but I do think there's some very janky shenanigans you can do with this card, and I do think it's definitely going to be a highlight for a lot of people playing it and such, because, well, shenanigans are abound when you try this card. I'm just going to say that right off the bat. But be prepared. It's a high-variance card, and high-variance cards usually vary whether or not they're going to be competitive or not, so we're going to have to wait and see, but it's definitely a card that I could see in Cycle Matter decks, to be legit honest. So, next up, let's see. We're going to go to actually a reprint, and actually a pretty good reprint for people who play Popper, Lead Stampede. Two in the green for a sorcery spell. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal any number of creature cards for a mana. Put the reveal cards into your hand. Put the rest in the bottom of your library in any order. Honestly, just a really good reprint for Popper, because Popper Elves does play this card. This is also something to consider, because this is the first time it's actually going to be available in Pioneer, and Pioneer Elves is a deck design that you usually see going around, so there is a very good chance that this might actually sneak into Pioneer Elves, or at least people will definitely try it. I could even see an argument of trying this in Simic Ramp, believe it or not, since Simic Ramp, you're definitely going to have to be the more creature-oriented variation of the design than the variation that we've seen where they use growth spirals and such but using this to get a bunch of like say Uros, agent of treacheries or stuff or being able to dig for late game essentially creatures that you want that could just be perfectly fine and free mana is not too much when you're playing simic ramp so it has a slim chance of seeing standard play you could also make an argument that drawing engine in the simic ramp is already consistent enough that they don't really need this but it's still an option to at least consider at the very least i would say Nevertheless, I like the card. It's definitely a good card for a reason. It has a good chance. And also, if you're playing Gruul Aggro that's creature-oriented or Mono Green Aggro, it's an obviously include, if I'm being quite frankly honest, because the draw engine you get from this is ridiculously absurd in that deck. It does make playing the Great Hand a teeny bit awkward, but not that awkward, if I'm being honest. Next up. Probably one of my favorite comments they revealed today, because I both love the name and I do kind of like this card a lot. <laughs> I just like foxes, okay? It's Volp Volpriket. It's free and a white. <laughs> but you can mutate it for two and a white. For a two-free fox bird. Seriously. 
<laughs> it has flying, and whenever this creature mutates, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. I actually like this card a lot, I'm not gonna lie. I do actually like it because it does have some pretty funny applications with it in Standard. Like, Incubation Druid is a card, so you can play like a turn two Incubation Druid, hope it doesn't get removed, and then you could just uh, Bulbakeet it, mutate it, and then just make a flying Gilded Lotus, which is legit hilarious. I do think this is also going to be a pretty decent limited card in, in itself, because if you're able to at least cast it for the mutate cost, you're still going to get what essentially is a free mana free 4 flyer, which in limited is actually really, really good. So, yeah, I like this card. I'm definitely going to at least try some little janky shenanigans with this, maybe like a budget-based brew and such, because it's just a really cute card. I like it a lot. <laughs> is it the most competitive card in the world? No. But it's at least a fun card. Now, speaking of a card that's ranged from fun... No, I'm not kidding. This is actually a pretty competitive card. Keenan Bond of Prodigy. Green and a blue for a Simic Mythic, a bear, a 2-2. Two -two. Whenever you tap a non-land permanent for mana, add one mana of any type that permanent produce. And it has an activated ability of 5 green and a blue to look at the top 5 cards of your library. You may put a non-human creature card from Mono onto the battlefield, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. While I'm thinking Simic is still a very competitive color currently in standard, like you see a variety of ramp decks, there is the Catch-22 that you are going to have to be more creature-oriented with Keenan at the moment. Like, you do have to play the Paradise Druids a lot more now, and all the Mana Dorks. With Simic... As many people have already stated, and I think I'm just pretty much quoting uh, Dev from Strictly Better Magic the Gathering here because he pretty much brought a good point when I was thinking that this card was absurd. A lot of people don't play Mana Dorks anymore. Like, they mostly play Asserence. They play stuff like Growth Spiral, Arbor Grazer, Uro, and such. Mostly because the board wipes currently in Standard are pretty prevalent. So, it does make playing this card a teeny bit awkward. But I think the place where this is going to be very competitive is EDH. This is a CEDH card if I've ever seen one. <laughs> I know many people have been making the argument of, well, you can actually make this as a casual Super Friends deck or some shit like that. You can try, but the thing is, that ability, whenever you tap a non-land permanent for mana, add one mana of any type that permanent produce, is pretty busted with how many mana rocks we have in the format. Like... The one that everybody talks about currently when they see this card is the Basalt Monolith combo, which, for those who don't know, you essentially tap your Basalt Monolith, which will tap for 4 mana. It has an ability on it that you can untap it for free mana. So you untap it, tap, untap, tap, untap for infinite mana, and then you can use that infinite mana for shenanigans. Like, many people have been joking that this is like the Eldrazi Lord, because with Basalt Monolith you can just get, like, infinite armies of Eldrazi out and such. And that is kind of hilarious, I'm not gonna lie. So... Yeah, it's definitely going to be an interesting card to see if someone will make a CD EDH deck out of it, but I think there is a very good chance that somebody will. For standard, I think it's good as at least a one of in Simigram, just because that activated ability in itself is after a pretty decent activated ability, since it can help you dig into your deck more. You can get your Uros, you can get pretty much your Cavalier Forns, you can get a lot of stuff that's actually pretty powerful there is a lot of like game threats in simic ramp that are stuff you don't mind tutoring out with that activated ability with the exception of say hydric paces nevertheless it's a really good card it's just going to be interesting to see how it does in standard but edh is just going to make an impact day one if i'm being quite frankly honest next up probably one of my favorite legendary creatures they showed off today Winota Joint of Forces, 4 color, 2 red and a white, for a 4-4 four, four legendary creature, Human Warrior. It has whenever a non-human creature you control attacks, so keep in mind, this stacks multiple times if you're attacking with multiple non-human creatures, so you gotta keep that in mind. So what does it do? Well, you look at the top 6 cards of your library, you may put a human creature card from among them onto the battlefield tapped and attacking... It gains indestructible until in a turn, put the rest of the cards on the bottom of your library in a random order. This is nutty. Like, this is going to be a ridiculously nutty potential brawl commander, but I do think this is just a nutty card in general for even standard. Standard Boros Aggro has been trying its best to be a thing, but it's really tricky. Like, most people, if you're playing aggro, you want to really just go to the mono red variation of the deck. 
But honestly, you can do a lot with Renota Join of Forces. If you have any way to enable haste on this creature, which let's be frank, there is already a lot of haste enablers that we have in standard and it's coming into standard, you can just sometimes... This could just be a good way to just essentially get a lot of board presence and sometimes just be a finisher. Like, we have stuff like Anats in the format, so when Anats dies, you get, like, multiple little satire tokens. And then the fact that you can just play with Nota, find a way to give it haste, and then essentially use all those satire token attack triggers to just get more human creatures, which there's already a ton of aggressive human creatures that are in the format in general. Sky Legion District I could think of. There's also Tatik. I can, like, go on and on. You could also get another Winota if you want to, though granted you're going to have the problem of the Legendary Wolf shenanigans, so you kind of have to keep that in mind. Still, I think this card has some really good potential of a Boris aggro deck that both can meet the requirement of both having a combination of non-human and human creatures. There's already been a lot of incentive for that deck design, like they got probably one of the better one cheap indestructible spells, so yeah, this has a good chance. I think it has a really good chance to see standard play. And the one card where people have been saying it's the worst... <laughs> Scryfall, why do you always have to make these goofy translation names? Part of your world. <laughs> okay. Let's not continue on that song because I don't want to get like a copyright strike. <laughs> anyway, blue, blue, red, 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 white, white for the Jeskai Ultimatum. And what does it do? Target player gains five life. This spell deals five damage to any target. You draw five cards. I know a lot of people were looking at this card and they were kind of disappointed on the card, but honestly, it's a pretty good spell. It's not as bad as people are giving it out for. Because all those abilities are kind of relevant. Drawing five cards, ridiculously absurd. Dealing five damage to any target, that can remove a majority of planeswalkers in the format, so you gotta kind of keep that in mind. It also can destroy a lot of majority of mid-range creatures, so it's a pretty powerful removal spell. And while gaining 5 life is kind of the more anticlimactic part of the card, it's still consistent. Because gaining 5 life, that is one fourth of your total life total in standard, so you kind of really... I know many people are kind of looking at this card and just being like, meh. But honestly, I'm going to say I do think this is one of the rare ultimatums that actually has a really, really good chance of seeing standard play compared to the other ones. Yes, the other ones are definitely going to be tried to play because Fires of Invention is still a card. But I do think this is playable because it's Jeskai. Jeskai has a lot of ways to essentially play with this card. There's stuff like Teferi to make this instant speed. There's also stuff like... Oh, I could just go on with some of the stuff you could do. There's stuff like, let's say you go into Thousand Year Storms and do Thousand Year Storm shenanigans with this card. That's also ridiculously absurd. Just, I feel like the amount of advantage you're going to get from this card is a lot more significant than people are going to. That's going to be a lot more relevant in Standard than the other cards. Though, granted, maybe the second closest would be the Mardu Board Life because, well, Board Life. The other ones still are really good, but I think they're more good for... EDH. And yes, maybe for EDH this is a little anticlimactic, but, and I'm going to say the biggest but, this is actually a really, really decent political card. Because yeah, you're always going to draw the five cards, it's always you, but that target player gains five life is actually a pretty semi-clever kind of politics thing because if you see an opponent that's at a low life total you can just and they're like the control player for example you could be like hey i'm gonna cast a spell you don't counter it i'm gonna give you the five life okay we're gonna remove this annoying threat there we go you have a little bit of politics within your card so i like this card a lot more than people are giving it credit for yeah it's not the most flashiest spell but one thing you have to kind of learn with standard playability and the playability of any cards it's not usually the flashiest card that sees play, it's the ones that are practical. And honestly, this ultimatum is probably one of the more practical cards they've revealed. So yeah, it's a really good card. You're probably going to see it in Standard. I'm not kidding. Nonetheless, we're now going to go on to another card, which is probably not going to see Standard play. <laughs> Legal Leosaur. Red and a white for 2-2, Dinosaur Cat Bear. 
Seriously, the fact that they're making dinosaur gadgets are hilarious. Though the kitten tokens they made are completely adorable. Anyway, it has a mutate cost of one hybrid of Boros colors. Whenever this creature mutates, other creatures you control get plus two, plus one until end of turn. Honestly, just a really decent limited card. I do think if you're in the Boros aggro deck, this is just a really good card to help you enable, kind of like, this is like your, essentially, your buff your entire army spell that you usually like to have in those decks to be as a finisher. And the factor that if you have enough mutate cards within your deck design that this can more or less be a repeatable effect cannot be underestimated for limited. In constructed, I don't know. I think it's a slight... They might try it out. It might be a lot better than I'm giving it credit for for standard, but uh, I don't know. It really is dependent on one thing that I'm not sure about mutate that uh, I really need to get a clarification whether or not this card will be standard playable and such. Okay, one clarification for Mutate, and someone could probably clarify for me more in the comments below. I'm probably going to ask over Discord and such the clarification on this. When you do the Mutate effect, now what happens is, let's say you try to Mutate a creature. Well, they did say that if you try, if the creature that is initially being targeted for the Mutate gets removed, this creature will enter the battlefield instead. What I want to know, and I probably should just ask clarification for this because I'm not 100% sure, I am still wondering if the mutate effect will still trigger, even though technically the creature hasn't quote-unquote mutated. It tried to attempt to mutate, but it hadn't mutated. So I am really curious to see if that effect triggers, because if that's the case, then I think this has a really slim chance of seeing some standard play. But if it turns out it's just if the mutate trigger, if it like just enters as a regular creature and the mutate trigger doesn't happen, then the card becomes less effective and it's more just a limited card. We're just going to have to wait and see. Keep an eye on it, but I don't really think so, if I'm being honest. This one is what they call the Snare Tactician. Two and a white for a human soldier. When you have your Psycho card, tap target creature and opponent controls, it's a 2-3. Honestly, just a really decent limited card. You never should underestimate tappers, especially in a format where we're going to have a lot of big creatures, like especially in Sealed and such. And the fact that this tap ability is a repeatable tap ability that all you just have to do is cycle is actually pretty nice. Now, I don't want to say go crazy with this. I don't think you should make this your consistent tapper. This is just good if you cycle one or two cards with it and be able to tap something to help you down. Like, I can see this, like, as a finisher tapper in some sense of the word. But I do think you don't want to get too crazy and limited with this because if you cycle a lot of your cards, you go dig deeper in your deck, and then you kind of can lose the game by accidentally milling yourself out. And we already have tappers in the format that you can just spin mana and tap a creature down. But the fact that you don't have to tap this down, all you have to do is cycle a card. Pretty relevant because then this can just attack in and such. So, eh, I think this is a very decent limited card. I want to, like, go pick it out of, like, a really good pack. But if I'm in white and I have some cycle cards, I'll definitely consider it. For standard, eh, probably not. I could be wrong, but no. Nah. They're just better cycling payoffs than a tapper, if I'm being quite frankly honest. Okay, let's talk about the Slitherly Sneak. A blue, black, black creature elemental nightmare. A free two with flash. And whenever you cast another spell with flash, you draw a card and each opponent loses two life. Ugh, this card is gross. The only benefit of this card is the factor that if someone tries to flash this in, you could still kill it with stuff like Shock and such. But if a Soul Tie flash deck was going to be a thing, it's because of this card. This card is pretty naughty. <laughs> Especially since we have a lot of flash enablers in the format. Like, we do have that 2-drop that it makes your flash spells uncountable. So the factor that you can have that out, and then when you cast this, it's uncountable, and then when you cast more flash spells, it just can go on and on and be very, very silly, especially since we still have a lot of flash spells in the format. It has a chance. It has a really good chance of seeing standard play, especially if that Soul Tie or Flash deck can be a thing. You can even make this into, like, other flash decks that are currently in the format. Would is this become Gritz's? Eh, possibly. Or can Mono Blue be a blue black uh, essentially flash deck? Absolutely. So, yeah, keep your eye on this card. It has a pretty decent chance. A very decent chance, especially if the flash deck can get off the ground, essentially. Next up, the 
yet again with the Scryforge joke names. Thinking about dragons. A Jeskai enchantment. One in Jeskai. For an enchantment, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, draw a card. To put it, to put it bluntly, yes, it's not a Jeskai Ascendancy, but it's still a good card. Like, the factor is you draw a card on the cast trigger and not if a creature enters the battlefield and such, or if the non-spell resolves. Makes this a pretty powerful enchantment because being able to consistently do card draw and such, even when your spells get countered, nothing to underestimate. Plus, there's also some silly combo shenanigans you can do this with an artifact-based design, so you gotta keep that in mind. This is also just decent in fires, I would say, because the factor is then whenever you cast your non-creature spells and, like, let's say you're playing fire super friends, for example, just any time you cast a planeswalker, you draw a card. Pretty absurd. Even in Jeskai Control, I could see this having a chance to see in play because you can do stuff just like, eh, I don't know, cast Elspeth's Conquer Staff, draw a card, or just cast a Shadow of the Sky. Oh, you don't have a creature that costs a form that is attack for power? Don't worry, this jam is going to make you draw a card anyway. So, yeah, this has a chance. This has a pretty good chance. The problem is, it is still a four cost enchantment. It's prone to removal, it is prone to disdainful strokes, so you kind of have to keep that in mind, but it's something to keep an eye out on. It's definitely going to see its play mostly in Commander and Brawl, I would say. Cool card. And I think that's the cards that have been revealed that I hadn't talked about yet, so... I hope you all enjoyed this series. This video was a lot shorter than I thought it was going to be, which is nice. Nevertheless, tomorrow, we are going to talk about all 90 cards and... Eh, that's going to be a long video. I apologize in advance for that. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed the brewing thoughts and shenanigans. I'm definitely, once the full set's going to reveal, I'm definitely going to probably have a video out where I show some of my brews that I will consider for the early asset stream, which, by the way, I'm actually going to be part of on April 15th and such. Wizards of the Coast had actually provided me a free account to actually preview the new expansion. It's going to be awesome. We're going to do some janky brews, maybe play some of the limited. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I definitely can't wait to do the shenanigans. Also, another thing to note, I'm still finalizing the details on this, but I'm actually going to do a review, kind of like host stream, where I'm going to host other content creators and such, and we're going to go through the whole set and do a proper review of it. Review the cards, look at them, see their possibility in multiple formats and such, and just pretty much give our two cents. I'm still finalizing the details on that. I'm definitely going to have an announcement on it pretty soon, as soon as Friday and such, so keep your eye out for that. Nevertheless, I hope you all have a lovely day. This is Love Depth, signing out. Bada beep, bada boop.